what we're going to do now, we've had a few questions come into the chat. So if we could invite back all of our speakers from this first half of the meeting. So um, please do switch your cameras back on if you don't mind. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Steph to um, ask some questions from our chat. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. Um, so first of all, a question for John. Um, you've been asked, how do you feel about single dose radiotherapy for VT in DCM and ischemic cardiomyopathy and perhaps in HOCAM too? Um, thank you very much. It's a very good question. Um, I'm, a, I'm a very interested in radiotherapy um, and I think it will have a role um, that the role will expand. So far it's been used um, approximately 50-50 in terms of ischemic cardiomyopathy and then the more general um, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy as it's been grouped together. But I think the, the way I think of um, the benefits of cardiac radiotherapy is it's, um, it's a modality that may have a benefit for patients who are simply too frail to have um, another um, attempt at an ablation procedure. So if they're just not going to tolerate it from a hemodynamic perspective um, and in terms of reaching deep myocardial substrate, um, which you struggle to deliver energy to through um, an ablation catheter. Um, and so um, I think that with those considerations in mind, actually the DCM population, particularly those who um, who are precarious hemodynamically and then the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients with that very, very deep um, substrate that's difficult to, to get at might represent um, very good, um, very good candidates for this type of therapy. Um, our, our, our current patient that we're working up for radiotherapy is a DCM patient um, who's had a recurrence after a, after a very long ablation procedure, which they struggled with. So I think there's definite potential there. Um, I would say this is still very experimental. Um, almost all of the data um, is observational, has been done um, on a compassionate use basis. Um, and whilst some of the results have been really encouraging, there's also a huge amount we don't know about this therapy yet. So. Um, as far as possible, all, all these treatments should really be undertaken as either part of a trial or, or, or as some kind of registry so we can continue to learn how to most effectively select those patients who are going to benefit from it um, and then deliver it in the most, uh, in the most effective way. Um, that's great. Thanks very much, John. Um, and actually, we have got another question for you, so don't turn your mic off too quickly. <laughs> um, but the, the second question was, would you offer an AF ablation for a single episode of paroxysmal AF without an obvious trigger, completely normal investigations and a child's vast score of zero in an ICC versus non-ICC patients? Um, so, so I'm, thank you for um, for taking on board my my comment that we should be seeing these patients early. Um, uh, uh, I, I have to say I'd be very happy to see them in clinic, but I, I don't think it would be appropriate to offer an ablation um, on the basis of a single episode of AF. Um, but that said, in that clinical context, I think one may have a reasonable expectation um, in the, that there would be further episodes. So at least in my own perspective would be that I would be happy to meet with them to establish a relationship. Um, and in the event of uh, a second or third ep episode over an appropriate time frame, that would be when I would start to sort of um, start to explore the possibility of, um, uh, of an air fibrillation. And I would take that approach um, in both the ICC and the non-ICC group. Um, I, I'd also actually, I wonder whether Manish, you'd add anything to that, um, to, to that comment as well. No, I, I totally agree. I think the more difficult one is from the recent, the more difficult group for us in EP will be that recent trial at uh, ESC, which I've not seen uh, published yet, which was in more advanced heart failure with early use of AF ablation showing benefit. I don't understand that mechanistically in patients with that advanced phenotype, but that could be a group where the decision making is going to be more difficult. Completely agree with that. Oh, sorry, Manish, I don't think we just missed the last part of your answer there. <laughs> ah, OK, uh, I can say that I said no, I totally agree with um, John's comments in that um, I would approach atrial fibrillation ablation in patients with or without inherited disease in exactly the same way. Um, interventional therapy for atrial fibrillation does carry risk and on, on the basis of one episode, it's probably the, not the right time to undertake that, but it's better to have these discussions early. The comment that I made was the more interesting group and the more complex group, which I think we are now going to get involved in and manage are those with advanced cardiomyopathy, some approaching the need for mechanical support or already have it and 
we saw at the recent ESC conference, although I don't think it's been published yet, that AF ablation improved outcomes in that more advanced heart failure group. Um, they're not the group that one has undertaken ablation on previously, but interestingly, it's shown some benefit. And I think mechanistically, we need to give that some consideration as to why there was that benefit and then look at the technical details. Great, thank you very much for that. Next question was for Claire. Um, what proportion of families offered referral from the coronial system to an ICC service take up that offer? And do families receive bereavement support? Thank you. Um, I was actually just uh, 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 messaging Elaine, who works in North East in Yorkshire, and between her and myself, we haven't had anyone decline to be referred, um, but I'm not entirely sure about all the other areas. Um, and for the bereavement support, initially the coroner's officers will signpost to the crime BHF telephone advice lines. And um, that's uh, obviously for the uh, more about the cardiac screening perspective, but there is also bereavement support through them um, and other charities such as Cruise. Uh, at Great Ormond Street and Barts, we both have um, in-house cardiac psychologists. So for um, the North Thames area, um, once the families were referred through, then we then we have that um, uh, support there. Thanks, Claire. Um, next question was for Manish. Um, so your case number two that you presented, uh, why CRT from the beginning when there was no uh, bundle branch block and left, the left ventricle wasn't severe? Yeah, that's a great question. And I asked myself exactly this. So this is where prognostication is difficult. And what we know is in this young lady's case, her family history was quite malignant. So her mother died, if I remember correctly, at the age of 58 of heart failure. Her maternal aunt had a heart transplant and she carries the same mutation. And over two years, there has been a progressive change in her conduction system. So she's developing first degree heart block. She's had an atrial arrhythmia. So there is some myopathic process going on. Her ejection fraction is dropping and her LV volumes are going up. So some change is happening. So we could just sit on this and wait till we have a clearer indication. Even as it stands, she already had a higher risk for arrhythmia. So it'd be interesting if Dr. Bashar thinks, should we have even thought about an ICD? So that was my first question. Should she have had an ICD? And my feeling was her risk was quite high and we're starting to see quite rapid transition in her phenotype. The next question is then more tricky. So she's young. I could have given her an SICD, but the rate of progression is unpredictable. And we know that once you start getting atrial fibrillation and you've already got heart block, that pacing is coming. And then when she paces, if she then starts to pace her RV alone, we may accelerate the development of heart failure. So in experienced hands, the procedural complication rate of dual chamber pacing versus CRT, and I don't do CRT, so I gave it to a more experienced colleague. Um, one could say that that risk had to be balanced and there was quite a lot of discussion around this. So she's actually been programmed VBI 40. So she's not using her pacemaker tachytherapies are on and therefore we can then switch her pacing on when she starts to need it. And the reason we also went for the CS lead is that if she then developed, let's say three years into her disease course of pacing LV impairment, an upgrade carries a two to three percent risk of complication and infection and then we're going to extract. And as someone who does extraction, I don't want to be in that mix. So that was our stepwise rationale, but I'm happy to hear from what others would have done. I, I think I, I think we would do the same. It'd be interesting to see how she does progress, but I think with similar patients that we've had with that variant, with that sort of malignant family history, once they start to progress, they do start to progress fairly quickly. And like you say, if they're going to pace the RV quite a lot, that's going to accelerate things. Um, further. So so I think we would do very similarly with with that, with your patient. I wonder, Chiara, if um, we could ask you a question, but more related to Brigada syndrome. I know that's sure. something that you've uh, 
worked a lot uh, on um, with Elijah Fair, and I think what came out as uh, in a in a few of the talks earlier was the difficulties in risk stratification in Brigada syndrome, and in particular that intermediate group. There's the clearly low risk inducible type one, totally asymptomatic, and then there's the you know secondary prevention ICDs or the patients who have perhaps a clear cardiac like syncope. What's your approach to the patients who sort of sit in between that, the asymptomatic but spontaneous type 1 ECGs? Right, yes, that's, uh, that's a good question. I think uh, there is a lot of uh, differences also um, by country. So, for example, in Europe, the EP study is used a lot. So if you go, you know, Spain, Italy, uh, Brussels, of course, the Brugada, um, the Brugada Brothers School, they do the EP study a lot and they believe in it a lot. Uh, sometimes, you know, um, it, it, it do, giving indication for ICDs maybe at a lower threshold. Uh, but I think that after the 2015 meta-analysis by Schrubeck uh, on more than 1,000 patients uh, with DP studies, um, there is maybe a use for EP studies in those patients with asymptomatic type 1, uh, when if you don't induce anything, you can estimate the yearly risk around 0 0.7, 0 0.8, and if it's positive instead is 1.7. So, you know, this difference is possibly enough to justify uh, the discussion about the ICD. And this is what we do here uh, at George's at the moment. So um, having said that, you know, uh, there is also be a lot of debate about the protocol, two or three extra stimuli, the guidelines now set um on two extra stimuli without being too aggressive so again this is another thing to take into account uh, but i would say for the asymptomatic patient uh, the type 1 the uh, ep study is at least suggested and then we move from that if it's negative we still do something else so we discuss about the loop recorder uh, which is you know just to keep an additional eye in the presence of not only ventricular arrhythmias so tachyarrhythmias but also bradyarrhythmias. arrhythmias and this is something that we have observed um, with the finding of few ventricular standstills um, associated with unexplained blackouts in Brugada patients. The numbers are very low, so we cannot say if it's you know, uh, genetically related or uh, is more frequent in those with a spontaneous type 1, but it's worth exploring uh, what's also the prevalence of the Brady arrhythmias in these patients. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, I mean, I think that they're a really difficult group to look after, aren't they? The spontaneous type ones when they're asymptomatic. And I know we've spoken with you and Elijah about doing similar um, with ours in terms of EP studies and loop recorders. Um, Manish in Birmingham, what are you doing with your patients who fall into that group? I think you're muted. You're right. You think I'd have got used to the mute button after all these years. <laughs> uh, so, you know, our practice is still much more away from EP study, although the, it's constantly under discussion. We have a very low threshold for the loop recorder. Um, I think there will be a transition in our approach, as Chiara will know, Dr. Ensam, who trained uh, and did his research with Chiara and uh, Professor Baer, works with us now. So, yeah. It's about pract how to fit that in practically within the EP service, number one. What is the overall yield from EP assessment? Because the discussion regarding what you'll do with the output of that test needs to happen before undertaking that test with the patient. So if ahead of time the patient is not particularly keen on an ICD anyway, then undertaking that test where that door is opened, I think can lead to more challenges in managing the ambiguity around risk. So that's the bit that I find the most difficult. Um, yeah, so risk stratification for spontaneous type one pattern, I think remains kind of a cloud over us <laughs> and it's an unquantifiable risk and particularly those, and they always seem to have a slight preponderance to what sounds like vasovagal syncope. Uh, 
Um, so yeah, so our practice is vigilance, low threshold for a loop recorder. I don't know about things like QRS fragmentation, you know, undertaking an EP study. A lot of this data seems to have also come from patients who already had a device. So there is some selection bias in that data set. So I'd be interested to hear what Kiara thinks about those. Yeah, as you said, there is no um, um, consistent evidence that say your work. I believe early repolarization is one of the most commonly validated in different cohorts because of course you know you have a study publishing that QRS fragmentation is very bad especially if you look at the uh, Asian um, studies in you know, Japan, Thailand, all those um, maybe also ethnically based uh, risk factors but when you try to reproduce the same uh, ECG parameters in a different population uh, the chance chances are that you won't find the same results so aside from early repolarization uh, possibly the genetic phenotype, but again, you know, the yield of genetic testing in Brugada is so low that you cannot rely con consider beyond this. Uh, so I think in great cases, uh, even with the help of clinical data, sudden cardiac death, you may make a case. And if you're really in doubt, I would agree with the loop recorder, because of course it's best to have a closer look in any case. Lovely. Thank you all very much. I'm aware that time is ticking and probably people would like to have a little break and before the next session starts at three. So, so thank you so much to all of our speakers for your wonderful talks. We've really enjoyed hearing them and thank you for hanging around to discuss and take questions afterwards. Um, we will have a 12 minute break now um, and reconvene at three o'clock for the second part of the session. So thanks very much all.